everyone. Thank you for joining us for AO Trauma North America's Orthopedic Trauma Journal Club series. Tonight, we will be discussing non-unions and some great articles for you. Uh, I'm joined with my uh, co-moderators, Jeffrey Potter, as well as uh, Jason Strelzo, uh, to discuss the four articles that we have. Today, we have nothing pertinent to disclose. Uh, your objectives for today are to go ahead and at the end of this session, we'd like for you to critically interpret the reviewed articles from the perspective of the author, uh, identify the key take-home messages of the presented articles, and identify how these articles can, uh, can apply to your practice and future directions. We have a great selection of articles uh, today. We have a unified theory of uh, bone healing and non-union, as well as open reduction and internal fixation for humeral shaft non-union. Bone grafting is not routinely required and avoids donor site morbidity, followed by antibiotic cement coated nails for the treatment of infected non-unions and segmental bone defects, and plate fixation of femoral non-unions over an intramedullary nail with autogenous bone grafting. We're very fortunate today to have authors from each one of the papers join us uh, following the conclusion of the videos. We will play the four videos, uh, which involves an interview and discussion regarding each article in the order that they are presented. And then we'll be able to answer questions to the audience and the faculty, as well as the moderators will uh, join us. We have Malcolm Smith, we have William Oliver, Jan Dr. Janet Conway, and Bill Bremsey joining us this evening. For your reference, these are the references of the articles. Um, so I'm uh, Jason Strauss. I'm an orthopedic uh, traumatologist here at the University of Chicago, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce and discuss um, with uh, Dr. Uh, Malcolm Smith the paper of his called A Unified Theory of Bone Healing and Non-Union, uh, the uh, BHN Theory, published in the Bone and Joint Journal in, in 2016. So uh, Malcolm, thanks for uh, spending your evening with us uh, and discussing this paper. Uh, maybe tell us a little about yourself and, and uh, where this paper kind of started. Thank you, Jason. So I'm Malcolm Smith. Um, I'm also an orthopedic traumatologist currently at UMass in Worcester, although I spent a long time down in Boston. Initially trained in the UK, as I'm sure you all realize. Um, so the paper was a concept that came out of some meetings in the UK the primary idea was David Elliott, but you'll see a lot of people are named on the paper and a lot of them contributed a great deal. Essentially, we, we just challenged ourselves one night um, after a meeting to try and understand and be able to present the philosophy and bone healing process better. Uh, and that went right to, to developing a full theory of bone healing and when you just see presented in the paper. Um, I suggest I show you a PowerPoint that interviews to, it uses the whole thing and then we can ask questions based on that. So this paper was published in 2016. Um, although I wrote it primarily with Chris Moran, I was not the initiator of the whole thing. And the majority of the ideas began with Dave Elliott and probably Kevin Newman really. Um, what happened was that there's a pretty in, very good meeting in the UK called the Nottingham Fracture Forum. And it ended up with this talking about David's con concept of purely mechanical theories and non-union uh, and how bone healing works and challenging ourselves to, to think about it in a different way. And that, that thought process led to some diagrams and, a pro and an understanding that I'm going to show you now and led to this paper. So the paper was presented as consideration of a theory. It's the same way physics theory is put out there for people to think about and discuss. It's not based on hard data. It's based on human understanding of what we see every day. So BHN stands for Bone Healing and Non-Union Theory. These are the basic concepts that we came out with. Normal practicing surgeons look at and watch bone healing all the time in our normal practice. The overall concept is that healthy broken bone heals. It forms bone, it heals, and then it remodels. David introduced a, t a concept called the bone healing organ. In the paper, it was called the bone healing unit because the reviewers reduced to accept the, the, the term organ, but it's an organ, right? It's the bone healing organ. And the concept is that the bone healing organ is specifically identifiable. It, it itself is biologically active. It heals the fracture and it does so by responding to the strain. The diagrams you're gonna see just help in that understanding. When we internally fix 
structures, we clearly do so without damaging that basic biology. That's what biological fixation is. But what we technically do is we change the strain over the fracture. We put it in place and we alter the local strain. And I think you'll see how this concept lets you see what actually happens when, that, when we do our surgeries. The bit highlight in red is what illustrates the non-union is. In a non-union, the concept is that the bone healing organ is still intact. It's not dead. It's not, it is responsive and it will change its action based on how you apply, reapply the strain on. And um, most people will go through this say, trophic and hypertrophic. We do not believe in that philosophy at all. Uh, Non-unions are either biological or mechanical. And across the board, mechanical vastly dominates. It, a, a biological non-union is an extremely rare thing. I'm not talking about defects here. Defects are different. Non-unions and defects are different things. The whole concept follows Stefan Perrin's understanding of how different tissues form with different degrees of strain. If you apply a strain of tissue, granulation tissue will form strains 100%. A tissue will lengthening by its own, its own length, getting twice as long. As the strain goes down, different tissues can form. Fibrous tissue, 20%. Cartilage can lengthen 10%. And bone, if it can lengthen at all, can lengthen no more than 2%. Above 2% of the strain, bone can't, be, can't form. If you then look at a graph where you have bone formation in the green and bone resorption in the red and put it against strain and concentrate on that area down there, we challenged ourselves to illustrate it graphically, and that paper does. This is the graph we came up with. Essentially, above this level, there's too much strain, you can't form bone. In this zone, bones formed. Below this zone, you have normal homeostasis where our bones are sitting every day, all the time. But if you work hard, they'll form more bone. If you, if you stop doing things, they'll, 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 they'll resolve bone. That's where Wolf's law normally works. That's normal remodeling. It's shown in more detail in the paper. And below this level, bone is resolved because there's enough strain on it. This is the old lady in bed. It's the astronaut in space. This is where there's not enough pressure on the bone. So then what we're aiming to do is get the bone into this zone so that it will heal. And all, all fracture healing does is it reduces the local strain around, around the fracture so that the tissues get into a level where bone will form. So it goes from small strain to less strain and, and brings the fracture healing. It just does this. It'll eventually get to a position where it will normally remodel the bone. If you think what we do with surgery, right, if they look, they're looking at that 2% zone, there's a fracture that's healed, and it's got a plate on, it's under a free flap, as you can see, there's a plate on. It's got no callus under the, where, where the screws are, a little bit of callus here, and a lot of callus here. There's a little, very little strain there, a bit more strain there, and more strain here. Basically, this is absolute stability towards this end of the spectrum. This is stability in the bone healing zone. Up here, it's too high, it will not form bone. So relative stability sits in this spectrum and absolute sits down here. And that's what we're doing when we put a plate on bone. Non-union, which is where we're getting to with this um, session tonight, is basically, I think, nearly always mechanical failure. Uh, the, the, the fracture is trying to get down to that zone where it will form bone. And for some reason, it fails to get into this zone and stays up here. Typical non-union, this is a common unit femur. Treat with what is actually quite a flexible, old-fashioned nail. You will see most of the fragments heal in, and quite typically, the, the strain has come down. It's forming bone in some zones, but fail to form in one coming through here. And it ends up sitting here for one part of the fracture, which leads to the ununion. We look, we're surgeons. We see this all the time. And what you will see is these non-unions and common unit fractures are almost universally uniplanar. Only one zone fails to heal because the strain is spread out all, all these fragments initially. They all heal in and they fail to heal when the strain is now concentrated at one level. It becomes too high for that level to form bone. You get an oblique clear and non-union. It nearly always is oblique because the strain is concentrated at a sheer level, which is higher than that. And there's some more papers written, written since then that show how the non-union plane tends to concentrate in the oblique level. And that's it. It's about understanding the bone healing organ and how it graphically works and, and how it doesn't work. I think there's two things that, uh, that we talked about just before, um, before we started recording that I think are worthwhile bringing up. One, 
uh, being, you know, if you are uh, approached with a fracture or a non-union, what do you do with that existing callus? Because it's, you know, you'll hear two sides of the coin. Some people say, I take all the callus out. And then obviously based on, on the, the paper here, I think the suggestion is probably not to do that and really just address the mechanical side of things. Maybe touch on that for us a little bit. So since I, we wrote this and we thought it through more, um, the concept that was presented to me was, was not to take the non-union out. It's not the callus, right? The callus around the area are different to the non-union itself. I think that the spectrum of non-union from a, five, a cartilaginous non-union, which is a white oblique line that you'll see across the fracture zone, to a fibrous zone that moves a little bit, to a synovial non-union where the strain is so high that the bone healing organ in that area has been destroyed. If there's an intact tissue bridge between the two ends of the non-union, I do not take it out. I utilize the anatomy of the fracture. If it's oblique, I want to put a live screw across that area and put a plate to neutralize it and compress it. If it's more transverse, which is very rare, I'm going to use a big, heavy steel plate. The heavier it is, the better it is. It's always steel, never titanium, because it's stiffer, and the non-union is invariably healed. If it's a synovial non-union, and, and the tissue where the non-union gap has been destroyed by extra strain, then you've got to remake the bone organ. Um, you, you correct and, and go through the, the cortical edge of the non-union site, break it down, make it bleed again, and then put it back together again and treat it like a primary fracture. Yes. Um, I guess one, one final question for you would really be uh, taking this theory and, and moving forward with it, where would you like to see the sort of the next iterative steps? Of the paper is offered as a theory. And the end of the paper, it, it, it ended with, please stimulate interest and discussion. And I only got, I was a corresponding author, and I got one reply from the whole world, and that was from China. I was very surprised because every time I presented it, it's been really well received, but it, it did never generate the amount of debate I thought it would do. It needs data showing results of, of mechanical treatment only. There's quite a lot of that come out already. Um, you've heard of bob screws? Maybe for the, the, the people that are on the, the call today that don't know the Henley screw, can you maybe describe that and, and sort of describe the use or the uses of that, uh, that technique? Um, the, the, the nickname is Bob Screws after a surgeon we called Bob Hanley, who basically described percutaneous fixation and non-unions. If you've got a non-union that's actually stable with an implant in the body, so there has to be, it has to be actually stable, uh, a, a locked nail, and it fails to heal, and there's an oblique non-union, then if you just do percutaneous screw fixation around the, the, the nail, Lining up the screws to try and make them as lag screws or position, or even Bob says position screws, but I prefer a lag screw to try and reduce the strain over the non union side. Then 75 80% of patients will then go to heal it without doing a big invasive procedure. Uh, although Bob presented that the, the, the healing rate with his technique was in the high 90% range, that's not been my and, and And overall, looking back at all my non unions, I, I used to do quite a lot. Um, the, the more heavier you fix them, the better they, the better they do. If you use an exchange nail technique, I think you're looking at 70 or 80% of them getting better. If you put a big plate on, then 95% of them plus get better. The stiffer you make them, the better they do. Now, then it depends, of course, on what the patient wants to have done, how invasive they want the procedure to be, because you've got to do a fairly invasive procedure to make them really stiff. Well, that was uh, really informative. I appreciate the time you took this evening to review the paper and the, the concepts uh, involved and I'm um, looking forward to the question period uh, coming up here. Today we're welcoming uh, Dr. Will Oliver out of Edinburgh and we're gonna be discussing his recently published paper in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, Open Reduction and Internal Fixation for Humeral Shaft Non-Union, Bone Grafting is Not Routinely Required and Avoids Donor Site Morbidity. Welcome, Will. Thank you very much, and thanks very much for the invitation. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, I was hoping you could start by giving us just a quick summary of uh, your study and what the major findings were. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, this uh, was a, a retrospective study looking at the outcomes of uh, patients managed in our centre over a 10-year period who developed uh, non-union after a non-operatively managed uh, humeral shaft fracture. 
So it was a retrospective study. We basically looked back over all patients who fitted those criteria and we came out with a cohort of 86 patients that we were able to uh, follow up. And I guess the three major findings that we identified from the study were at first that uh, humeral shaft non-union surgery in our cohort of patients was associated with a high rate of subsequent union. So this, the union rate after fixation in our um, study was 93% overall. And within that, for patients in the study who were managed uh, without autologous bone grafting, which was the substantial majority of our study cohort, um, the union rate was 95%, regardless of the type of non-union that the patients had developed. So the union rate after an atrophic non-union was 94%, and the union rate after a hypertrophic non-union was 96%. So that kind of demonstrated to us anyway that plating without bone grafting was um, effective in generating uh, union in this group of patients. The second main finding, I think, that, that we wanted to highlight was the relatively low rate of complications. Um, so uh, like all uh, non-union papers, I think we, we accepted that we were expecting a slightly higher rate of complications compared to say primary humeral shaft fracture fixation. We identified a 6% overall rate of transient radial nerve palsy. And the rates of things like superficial infection, 7%, deep infection, 2%, were very much in keeping with, um, you know, the, the numbers that you find in the established literature. But one interesting aspect was uh, looking at the, the small number of patients, only eight in our study, who underwent iliac crest bone graft augmentation along with their fixation. So of those eight patients, three of them developed a donor site complication. So um, that's a 38% overall rate. There's one patient with a, um, a wound hematoma, which required uh, dressings and additional outpatient follow-up. And two patients developed uh, transient lateral femoral cutaneous dysesthesia, which was, uh, sorry, it wasn't transient. It was persistent at the time of final follow-up. So no major complications so from the donor site requiring further uh, surgery, but nonetheless, um, not a completely benign intervention in our center and add that to the sort of context where potentially we have iliac crest bone grafting being unnecessary in most patients and also exposing patients to those, um, you know, potential, albeit relatively minor, uh, donor site complications. The third area, the sort of final thing to highlight, I think, was the patient reported outcomes, which we also obtained from those uh, patients who are living and cognitively intact and had valid contact details. And of those, um, we found that there was a definite trend towards um, inferior function uh, and uh, you know, according to the quick dash and the uh, physical component summary of the SF12, as well as uh, higher than expected rates of things like pain and dissatisfaction with treatment outcome. And that was across the board, regardless of whether bone grafting was used or not. And that I think kind of hints at you know, maybe there is a long-term uh, legacy to non-union that these patients perhaps weren't as, as happy and, and as functionally uh, uh, adequate as we had hoped they would have been uh, given the longer-term nature of the follow-up. You think that that would have been uh, different if you'd had a cohort that um, included people who'd healed primarily? Well, I think I think that's a great question and actually we um, here uh, have run a, a study looking specifically at that to see whether it's it's the fact that you have a non-union that is is what impairs your uh, your outcome so we actually have a paper that's impressed with the jot at the moment comparing those who united primarily with those who united after non-union surgery we found that the non-union actually does seem to be an independent risk factor for a poorer outcome yeah why did you guys do this study now was there some pre-existing literature that that prompted a change in your treatment protocols or what drove this? I think if you look at the literature um, around humeral shaft non-union fixation, a lot of it involves the cohorts which were managed with plating with, sub with additional uh, bone grafting, usually autologous iliac crest bone grafting. There's only a handful of uh, papers which document outcomes of uh, surgeries without um, uh, adjunctive bone grafting and, and there's a great review by Peter Zettau 
uh, out of the Netherlands who uh, published their systematic review in the journal Injury in 2015, and they found just two studies involving a total of 19 patients with uh, you know, outcomes documented for uh, humeral shaft nonunion fixation without uh, bone grafting uh, associated with it. So there's a, potentially a slight gap in our understanding, and it, it didn't really fit with our own practice in Edinburgh, as I say, Professor Keating, among others, has long been an advocate of, of uh, you know, simple plate fixation um, done well. Uh, and and uh, his experience, which is obviously extensive, didn't, didn't seem to match up with uh, the prevailing wisdom in the literature was that, uh, you know, that, that uh, bone grafting was a, a necessary adjunct for these patients. So that, I think, was the motivation to see, okay, what, what are our outcomes? You know, how well do we do? Is there a difference? Should we be doing grafting more often? And that was regardless. I mean, these results that you've had are regardless of whether or not somebody was what would traditionally be considered a hypertrophic or an atrophic non-union, which I think was maybe a little bit um, eye-opening in this study as well. Yeah, well, I think that's it. If you look, digging deeper into the literature, the um, evidence for um, plate fixation without bone grafting in atrophic non-unions is vanishingly small. I think they're about six or seven or eight patients or something in the literature um, and you know we had 40 or 50 in our series is it's one of those where I think the the reality is we know from uh, several very useful basic science studies that even atrophic non-unions are usually sufficiently vascular and uh, retain the key bone signaling components you know like bone morphogenic proteins and things in order to unite if the mechanical environment is corrected appropriately. And I think this paper kind of very much echoes with another paper, which I know is up for discussion in this journal pub from the group out of Nottingham, uh, where they looked at that unified theory of bone healing and non-union. And although, as we all know, you know, non-unions can be biological or mechanical, um, I think in clinical practice, the reality is the vast majority of humeral shaft non-unions are probably mechanical, even though the you know even though they may be atrophic or oligotrophic. And if you correct the mechanical environment, predominantly with you know plate fixation, interfragmentary compression, and, and stability, then the majority of them do go on to unite uh, without the need for anything extra. Yeah. So after all of this, how do you guys decide who needs who needs bone graft? I think the indications for bone graft are unclear. For no, un, you know, in no way are we trying to suggest that there is there is no role for bone graft. I think bone graft is is absolutely critical in certain situations, especially in failed primary fixation, for example, or recalcitrant non-union. Um, but I think all that this all that this study suggests is that it may not be needed quite as often as as um, some authors have previously. Uh, felt, especially in the setting of, of uh, failed non-operative management. Do you think that we can apply these findings to any other non-union sites? <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that because I think one other thing about the existing literature is that a lot of literature suggests that you don't need bone graft for other long bone non-unions. So um, Prof Keating again, senior author on this paper was a senior author on a, um, a, a review of uh, the risk factors and outcomes of long bone non-union in, in the clavicle, the humerus, the forearm, the femur and the tibia. And actually, the humerus is a bit of a uh, sort of was out on its own uh, in terms of the predominant prevailing wind, if you like, in the literature being um, one that suggests uh, bone grafting is the gold standard uh, along with plate fixation. So actually, I think this study potentially is is just balancing that argument a little bit, which in in the past has maybe been a little bit too heavily weighted in the favour of bone grafting. Um, and I think the principles of this, uh, as we've as we've alluded to from the Nottingham paper that you're going to discuss, are already being applied very readily elsewhere. Um, the reality is it's probably less applicable to um, lower limb fractures in that a lot of those are managed operatively in the first instance. So having a non-operatively managed femoral or, or tibial fracture is relatively unusual in, in uh, sort of both, both sides of the pond, I think. Mm -hmm. So that may be a, a factor to weigh in, but certainly in, in upper limb fractures, I, I think 
um, a non-union following non-operative management plate fixation alone is, is uh, you know, normally uh, and has been demonstrated to be very effective. Anything that you would like to add as a takeaway point from all of this? Maybe one thing that um, comes out of this is, is to highlight that um, however you do it, I think trying to identify and, and you know, get to the 20% um, or so of patients who are at risk of non-union after non-operative management is probably the key uh, you know, to improving overall outcomes because it's clear that you know, the majority of patients do extremely well with functional brace. Um, and it, you know, that, that will continue, I suspect, to be the, the default management strategy and quite rightly so. I think so there's probably is, is something more to be done uh, in terms of trying to identify and get to these guys before they uh, progress to an established non-union because as I mentioned that that may well uh, confer longer term functional advantages to them. Great okay thanks very much for joining us today. No, pleasure Jeff. I'm Paul Matazuski, and I'm here uh, with the uh, AO North America Trauma Journal Club, and I'm here with Dr. Janet Conway from the International Center for Limb Lengthening at the Rubin Institute for Advanced Orthopedics in Baltimore. Thanks for spending the time with us today, Janet. Thank you for the invitation, Paul. So we're here today to discuss the article that was published in the JBJS American Volume in 2008, entitled Antibiotic Cement Coated Nails for the treatment of infected non-unions and segmental bone defects. So we want, I wanted to start off the, the questions, uh, Dr. Conway, uh, just to get back some background as to what was the impetus for this, for this article? Why did you uh, perform this technique and start doing this technique and then and wanted to look back at, with this series? Sure. Um, well, uh... You know, um, initially, uh, you know, these patients are really difficult patients, the infected non-unions and the uh, segmental bone defects. And so, um, you know, in 2002 um, was like our first case when we did an antibiotic coated rod, a locked rod, you know, and we had used the mold method and uh, it was a custom mold and we did it um, for, uh, you know, a specific patient and it was a femoral rod and everything. And then we were able to wind up using that mold for multiple patients because you could sterilize it and um, it wound up being a pretty nice way to create an antibiotic coated nail, but it was like time consuming, labor intensive, and sometimes the coating was like just okay, but it, it actually did a good job. And like we used that for like our first um, 20 patients. And then, uh, you know, um, we were trying, always trying to figure out a better way to do it. Like the chest tube was a problem because it would melt to the, um, uh, cement if you didn't get it off fast enough and you can only do a certain diameter and so um, sort of the next generation um, was the silicone tubing method and so um, we had good success with the first 20 but it you know it was a pain in the neck the the, the mold method and so um, when we finally got that silicone tubing and we started using the tigon tubing with them and uh, it was great because it didn't melt to the tubing, the cement didn't melt to the silicone tubing, you could make it on the back table, and it was totally uniform, and you had a little bit uh, more control over the diameter, and it didn't, you know, uh, chip off when you put it in and take it out, so um, this uh, paper was sort of our, uh, we compared the first 20 uh, with the mold method, and then we um, then uh, compared the next uh, 29 or so with the um, tubing method. And so we had some nice uh, sort of comparisons because um, there was less complications with the tubing method and it was just easier, it took less time in the operating room. So uh, this was sort of our comparison paper and then sort of the transition to moving on to this better method for making the rod. Oh, that's wonderful. I guess the the follow-up question to that is prior to doing these statically locked antibiotic coated rods, what were folks primarily doing? Um, you know, uh, we were doing a lot of uh, guide rod coated um, with uh, chest tubing, you know, uh, so it was like uh, antibiotic coated uh, cement on a guide rod. And so we would do that and then either put them in an X-Fix 
and wait to sterilize the canal or put them in a cast or make them non-weight bearing. And so um, patients, 73% of the patients didn't have to have another operation. So we went from non-stable guide rods coated with um, antibiotic cement to stable statically locked nails coated with cement and we never had to go back. So it was, it was um, I don't know, really revolutionized my practice. Definitely, definitely a game changer. And, you know, <clears throat> you know, there was obviously a difference between the, the two, the two groups, the, the mold technique, as well as the, um, the silicon tubing technique. And that was an interesting point for me. Were there any other surprising things that you found in your, your results that you didn't expect? Um, you know, uh, I don't think there was too many surprises as far as just, you know, the, the coating was easier, uh, to put on, took less time. And then it was nice to not have to worry, like the complications from taking the rod out, putting them in were a lot less just because there was no seam on the, uh, rod going in, you know, it was like put in, uh, it was sort of like pressurized when you were making the uh, rod. And so uh, the fact that it was uniform and it was really like, um, uh, you know, there wasn't any like kinks in the cement molding, you know, it was just really put on like the, you could only compress the mold so much, but that tubing and putting the rod in, you put the, the cement in first and then you put the rod in. So you like fill the tube up and then you put the rod in. So there's a lot of force between the rod and the silicone tubing to really pressurize that cement. And I just feel like, you know, it was, uh, the, the complications really went down a lot with the uh, insertion and removals. And I thought that was great. And that was not a surprise, but it was a really awesome benefit from the second technique. And then, um, when we first started doing this, when I first started doing this, um, it was such a little bit like it was time consuming to mold. And so a lot of our initial patients we used were like, this is our last stitch effort before we amputate your leg. And then once we realized it actually worked and then we started getting the easier method, the silicone method, um, then we started using it in more patients because it was easier. So it's now been, geez, over 14 years since you started collecting data for this, this paper and being 2022, what, uh, what things do you think you've uh, learned since then? Do you think this technique is still applicable today? And, and what things have you changed since the publication of this article? Sure. Well, you know, uh, since we did the one from 2008, like we went on in 2014 and like published like a, a bigger series, you know, if you're comparing long bone non-unions and arthrodeses, the long bone non-unions had a higher percentage of patients that didn't have to have additional surgery than the arthrodesis patients. Sometimes we're doing these big segmental defects in the knee region. And so it was getting to be a little bit of a pain in the neck when the rod's not cannulated. And so the uh, guide rod, uh, long guide rod that we use to cannulate the knee arthrodesis nails has been really helpful for sort of shish kebabbing our uh, spacer across the level of the knee joint and um, just makes it easier to insert, takes less time. You know, I'm not like fiddling around with like a not cannulated rod. So that's like um, sort of the next level that we've been doing for some of these things. And then, you know, I still think the cement coated rods are an effective way to get antibiotic delivery and bony stability. But like, there's a lot of things um, moving forward that I think canals that are too tiny are hard to treat sometimes and you wind up not being able to coat a rod. And so sort of like the next evolution of things is calcium sulfate injections, you know, into the canals. And so we've been doing some of those things for cases where we really can't use an antibiotic coated rod. And so we'll use a smaller rod and inject the canal and put it in. And that's been pretty effective um, in cases where you can't coat a rod just because of the diameter of the rod plus the cement. So I think there's room for that moving forward. And the other thing that is sort of coming down the pike with these things are, you know, everyone has their own way to make the rod. And so there's a lot of people out there that do it their own way. Like Joe Shu has a really nice technique for, um, for fusion tubing that he uses. He's got a video out there on it. He just published in um, Journal of Orthopedic Trauma on that. He had like 30 cases uh, and that's been successful for him. And I use the silicone tubing. Some people still use the chest tube. Uh, 
And so there's a lot of variability out there of this technique because there's no standard rod that you can pull off the shelf from X company and put it in. And so I think that'll be also on the horizon is getting like a standard off the shelf rod. There's been some stuff in Europe, like there's been a couple of um, theories published by like Schmidmeyer on uh, genomyosin coated off the shelf nails and um, effectiveness and tibial non-unions and um, open tibia fractures. And they're showing some good results with that. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing that, that came up to me that I thought was interesting was that you use this method to treat a lot of folks with segmental defects as well. And you didn't really touch on that too much in the paper, but can you elaborate what your, your protocol was for those patients in, the, in this, this series? typically where you place in the antibiotic coated rod with an additional spacer around it and then doing a induced membrane technique or was it something entirely different? My favorite way to take care of these patients is transport over a nail just because I don't have to do too much work going back. You know, cut the bone, put the frame on, leave it on for X number of days, like, you know, two months, three months, come back, uh, put a little lock plate and some bone graft on and then take the X fix off. And so, uh, you know, that surgery, I could get him out of the hospital the next day. It was so quick putting the X fix on and doing an osteotomy and taking the spacer out. And then, you know, the next operation again would be about an hour going to surgery, putting a little lock plate on to hold the segment down, putting some bone graft in. And then um, the only difference, you know, with the bone transport and the keeping the rod in is I wouldn't let them weight bear during the transport. And I wouldn't let them weight bear for at least six weeks following the um, bone grafting, you know, so they had a little bit of time where they were, had to be off their feet, but, um, you know, that's how I manage some of those segmental defects. Mm -hmm. So for our, um, listeners today, the, the last question that I have uh, for you is if there's any take home points and the one thing that you'd want someone to get from this article, if they read this, what would, what would that be? I think if you take the time to do a good job making the nail, you know, and make sure the cement's kind of gooey and liquidy, like depending on how you're going to, what, what method you want to use. Um, it, you know, you don't want the rod too fat. Like this is where you're going to have problems. If the rod's too fat, if you don't do a good job making it, if you don't do a good job reaming your canal a couple millimeters over, like all these little technical pearls will keep you out of trouble. And so like if someone's like, oh my gosh, it's such a good idea. I want to try it. Like, you need to make sure that like, if you use two bags of cement, use a full extra monomer, uh, you know, cause you really need it to be liquidy because if you dilate that tubing too much, however you're gonna, whatever method you wanna use with the either perfusion tubing or the silicone tubing or the chest tube, if you dilate it too much, your rod diameter is gonna be really fat. And then you could get your nail incarcerated, you know, because you're not reaming like for that ginormous nail you're reaming for uh, you know, a smaller diameter. And so I'm really careful about making it so that I'm not gonna give myself trouble. And so say I use like a 12 and a half millimeter inner diameter tubing, like a half inch tubing, uh, I'll ream the tibia to 14, I'll ream the femur to 16 because there's a bow in the femur. And so sometimes that rod I'm putting in is you know, just based on the, when I'm, coating it with cement, sometimes the bow gets a little, you know, it's not as perfect because the silicone tubing is flexible. And so I overream the femur also too, because like um, the tubing as you're making a bigger rod sometimes get more di gets more dilated. And so I don't ever want to take a chance. I have one rod I put in that was incarcerated. And that was a bit of a drag. And so I'm always careful with overreaming a couple millimeters. So I'll ream, like I said, 14 in the tibia and then 16 in the um, femur and I'll really be careful making the rod so I'm not having any problems and I think if you're going to do it they're the biggest take on points be really careful making your rod for the diameter and definitely over ream and then when you take it out make sure you clean out the top of the sort of insertion area really well so that if you're taking the rod out you're not pulling the rod out of the cement you're going to pull the cement coating out with the rod so I always make sure when I'm taking it out, I clean out and make sure I see that little cement rim around the rod before I start pulling it out, just so I don't have to be like, oh man, the cement came off, you know? And so just being really careful with uh, inserting it, removing it and making it, I think keeps you out of trouble. And then starting to use it in simpler cases first, uh, 
is always my rule of thumb. Like the chip shot ones, like a pretty standard non-segmental bone defect ankle fusion or like a standard not big defect tibial non-union. And then as you get more and more comfortable with the technique, you can use it for harder cases, more difficult cases. And, um, you know, I think that's just in general, but they're going to take your own points. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time with us today. And I can't wait to try the technique. Well, thanks for having me, Paul. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone likes it. And Jay Conway at lifebridgehealth.org. If you have any questions, I'm always happy uh, for you to email me because um, I want everyone to successfully apply this. I think it's helped me and I'm looking forward for it to helping other people. So thanks again. Thank you. Today, we're joined by uh, Dr. Bill Abramski uh, from Vanderbilt. And we're going to be discussing his paper that was published in JOT in 2007, Plate Fixation of Femoral Non-Unions Over an Intramedullary Nail with Autogenous Bone Grafting. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. Would hope that you could start by telling us just a little bit about how this paper came about and where what the status of non-union uh, treatment was at the time. Yeah, so interesting that uh, sort of the idea for this came from a couple unique patients where that were clinical problems. Um, one was a young woman who had a big segmental defect, and we put the nail in her, and uh, and after I put the nail in, it was really wobbly still, and so. Uh, it was a big open uh, injury and it was all exposed. And so at the time, I just put a plate on it at the time to add additional stability because I knew I was going to come back and have to bone graft it and I thought it wasn't wobbly. And so that was one of the first times sort of a scheduled non-union, so to speak. And then two others were one, a uh, Hispanic guy who had a nail, femoral nail, a cloverleaf nail put in in Mexico, uh, you know, 20 years ago and he was playing soccer and it was a non-union and it broke. And then we couldn't get it out. I mean, I couldn't get it out. And, and so I thought, well, I guess I can plate it. So then we just played it over that and, and, uh, and bone grafted him and he healed. And one more was a guy who got nailed at an outside institution and then, then came to us and his start point for his femoral nail was so anterior. He actually had a gluteus medius injury, uh, you know, from his uh, nail insertion. And I didn't want to go digging around and the nail was sitting really anterior and he was a thick guy. And so uh, I just thought, well, I guess I can probably plate this. And, and those three cases were maybe the first three, I'm not even sure if they're in that series, but where we got the idea that, you know, maybe plating around a non-union, an exchange nail isn't always necessary. And so that was sort of the onset of the idea. So before you did this, do you want to just comment on what was going on in the literature and in orthopedics and what the traditional treatment would have been for similar non-union? Yeah, so the, the literature had been some controversy of whether or not a pure exchange nail was fine. And Larry Webb had sort of written an article, and I was in North Carolina at UNC at the time, and that an exchange nail had a very high success rate. Yeah, I forget the number, 85, 90%. Um, but Carolina's Medical Center had published just down the road from Wake Forest uh, that their union rate with a pure exchange nail um, was only around 50%. And so the question was, did you need more biology, more bone graft? You needed to breed the non-union. That's still a little bit maybe controversial today. And I would say it may depend upon the non-union type and where it is. It's metadapacil or diapacil. Um, but I think those are some of the controversies at the time. Uh, and then these uh, isolated uh, sort of clinical scenarios came up where really questioned I wasn't able to do an exchange nail or didn't want to do an exchange nail. Uh, and so we just looked at other ways of attaining and maintaining stability, uh, as well as uh, the opportunity to add biology with a bone graft. Yeah. And I guess one of the concerns at the time would have been whether or not adding a plate would have compromised periosteal blood supply in addition to the endosteal from the from the nail right yeah it's always been the uh, it, that was a theory uh, i think as we're you know learning that uh, you know dual plate plate nail combinations particularly in elderly patients uh, maybe it's that the additional stability you gain may be worth the risk of uh, increased vascular insult yeah do you want to just go through, if you don't mind, the process of, of how you 
uh, of how you went through the surgery then and and maybe if you've changed it all how you're going through it now yeah well it's uh, it probably all depends on where the non-union is whether it's a distal femur shaft or uh, or a proximal femur but and whether or not you think you need to exchange the nail or not uh and uh and most of the time you can do this without exchanging the nail. Uh, and uh, when I'm not planning on exchanging the nail, I'll have the patient in the lateral position uh, and then do a subvastus uh, approach uh, for as long as you need to make it. Usually I would counsel you to make it as longer uh, is better, at least to expose, make sure you see the, the, uh, the arteries uh, you know, the perforators before you cut them and you don't get one uh, while you're trying to stretch uh, and make sure you've got good control. Uh, and then you can get an adequate uh, debridement of the non-union site. Uh, and these are almost always atrophic or um, oligotrophic uh, non-unions. And you can debride the site and then get bone graft from wherever. Uh, you know, in the lateral position, I, I think that the posterior crest, um, many people are cautious. Uh, I think that Mike Bossy and the Atrium Group wrote a nice article. It's 4% chronic uh, pain. And, you know, people quote this uh, much higher percent, but I think if, if done correctly or uh, judiciously, that the incidence of chronic pain is extraordinarily low. Uh, and so uh, I think it's a great reservoir for bone graft. So again, if you're just thinking through the process of just maintain the principles of exposure, debridement, biology and stability, that how you get there is probably less important uh, than maintaining some sort of, uh, making sure you hit all those bases. Yeah. There's some fractures, hypertrophic in particular, that you don't have to take down the non-union site? Well, it's probably a, depends on who you ask. Um, I think that for me, the ones you don't have are the mid shaft, where maybe we put in a smaller nail. You know, we put in so many 10 nails you know, 10 years ago, I put in nothing smaller than a 12 nail. Uh, and now we're kind of minimal reaming a 10 nail. And that's fine, but it's maybe not if you're a six, six guy uh, who's, uh, you know, 250 pounds. Um, it, I think we've seen, I've seen a patient stand there and wobble his leg back and forth and say it moves. And I'm like, if I can hear it clicking. So I think 10 nails are great most of the time, but sometimes we may allow too much motion, they get a hypertrophic non-union. And those that are mid-shaft and hypertrophic, you can probably do a closed exchange nailing. Uh, I would say that's 10% of the non-unions I see, and that's a data-free opinion, but it's a guess, uh, where I think with a non-union with a hypertrophic mid-shaft, where you have maybe an undersized nail, that a pure closed exchange nailing is a reasonable idea. If you're if you're taking down a non-union site in an atrophic non-union, do you find that if you leave that if you're working around an existing nail that you have difficulty getting enough compression at the at, um, where you've taken down the non-union site? Well, most of these non-unions are are not you know pure clean fracture lines. You know, like like we see in oblique fractures acutely, where you can get AFT reduction and uh, compression. They're much more undulating and irregular. And I think the critical thing is stability and maybe not, or you may even have a gap, you know, and then you're not really getting compression. I think the key thing to me is stability. And I, uh, and I work for uh, biology and stability and how you, how you attain that. And the compression in that manner, I think is probably less important. You want to maybe just comment on your selection for when you're going to use a plate nail combo and when you're going to use a, a plate in isolation or whether you're going to just do an exchange nailing? Yeah, so uh, simplest first. So exchange nail is uh, probably, I think, as I said, with a mid shaft hypertrophic uh, nail where it's really trying to heal. And then I give the patient the option you can, I think that's one scenario where you could probably take out the interlocking bolts and allow some compression. And I, but on that, I think if you select the, I tell people it's about 50 to 75% effective, where a plate over that is probably 90% effective. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, when I would uh, do a, a plate nail combination are where, uh, you know, it's probably metadiapha seal, um, where uh, 
that uh, you you uh, just an exchange nail doesn't really give you that much more stability. So uh, a plate nail combination, metadiaphyseal, either uh, more distal than proximal, uh, and then um, a uh, plate only. Uh, Historically, that's all, you know, in my first 10 years of my training and practice, that's pretty much was the standard answer. If you said you were going to do a plate nail or an exchange nail on a metadiapsy, you would be crucified. So I think we're learning uh, that as long as you stick to the principles that it works. Uh, and so a plate only maybe around uh, when they have an implant, periprosthetics, of course, I think is a good example, uh, which uh, are relatively low event rate and we're part of a prospective trial of looking at periprosthetic fractures uh, and uh, just and to maybe give you a better idea, give surgeons a better idea what the event rate of that is. My guess is it's pretty high. So that may be the periprosthetics or where you have an implant in already or you can't remove the implant like, like uh, or you don't want to remove the implant from either it's in too far from the distal femur, it's a, a nail you don't you can't get out, it gets stuck. Uh, or uh, you can't, it, it's a clover, old clover leaf nail that were never designed to come out very well, or where you might just use a, uh, a, uh, just a plate, those three, those three examples. Is anything you want to add before we wrap it up? Yeah, I would say anybody who's listening, uh, don't uh, hesitate to challenge the status quo and to ask good questions and to be innovative in, in your, uh, in your thought process. That's how we get better. So uh, applaud Jeff for putting this together and I uh, hope it was helpful and uh, keep thinking and making us better. Great. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Great. So uh, those are those the, uh, the video reviews. And I just want to first thank uh, all of the, all of the speakers that were on uh, during the session today, we're talking about the, the papers and, and their experiences. Uh, I'll remind all the participants that if you have any questions for the speakers, please put them in the Q&A box and that way uh, we can get to them. Uh, and I will start with a couple of questions that have already come in and then uh, I have a few as well. So uh, please just type type the questions in uh, as you have them. So um, I think one of the first questions that uh, was put in the, the chat box here was actually for uh, Dr. Oliver. So. Um, I think I'm going to try and combine these two questions because they, they really kind of go uh, hand in hand. And the question was, what about the, the thought about uh, bone marrow aspirate and, and uh, using sort of like an RCT model to, to study bone grafting versus non-bone grafting in, in the patient population that you'd selected there? Um, well, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's ripe for investigation, isn't it? Because I think there clearly is a role for these things and, I, and you know there are still although we were reasonably pleased with the overall success rate of our um you know isolated plating procedures uh, there was some that did develop recalcitrant non-union after that um for reasons that you know in the context of a retrospective study are, are probably quite hard to elucidate so i think you know, uh, RCTs like that, where you tweak the sort of technical details and you, you know, um, experiment with that kind of stuff are uh, definitely useful. We haven't, you know, we, we certainly haven't got anything like that running in our center at the moment, but um, we're always, always open to ideas and keen to, you know, either initiate or participate in those things. Great. Um, and then a question for, uh, Dr. Smith, there's a question about how, how would you how would you ideally like to confirm the the BHN theory if you could? Well, listen to the story about the humor. Um, the essence of what I hope my microphone's working better during the video. I'm very sorry, it didn't sound very good. The uh, the theory basically suggests that the tissue in the non-union is healthy, and if you make it stable enough, then it will heal. And the answer is clearly going to be in surgical experience of doing exactly that without bone graft and thinking of neutralizing strain only, which I would suggest that the, the, the nail plate is doing the same thing, as is probably the larger nail when you're putting in the antibiotic nail, although defects are different to my knee. So it, it's going to be in the, the proof is going to be in results of the right sort of surgery where you don't add bone graft. But again, the gold standard has to be the RCT. Yeah. 
And as one just suggested, that's the right thing to do to prove this point. Perfect. And I'll probably ask for uh, Dr. Bremsky and, and Dr. Uh, Smith's thoughts on this next question, which is really um, for for your series of non thermal non unions with plating. Sort of what role, and I guess if any, does uh, Judea osteo periosteal elevation play? And maybe both of you can answer that if uh, if you have seconds. Yeah, I was just beginning to type out a uh, answer to that in the chat box in the question box. Uh, I think the the principles are that you improve the biology and the stability of the non-union. Um, and there are probably times when you need to do more periosteal elevation, you know, whether you shingle the bone or you burr the bone to try to make it more viable for where you probably need a bone graft. And then there are those where I think as Malcolm described, that you just need to improve the stability. And that might be just adding a plate um, and some local uh, local bone graft even to help you gain a place to fit your, uh, fit your plate. I would say it, so it, in, in many things in orthopedics, it depends uh, and on the type of non-union you're, you're dealing with. And it's probably more important that, uh, you know, sort of historically the periosteal sleeves or the uh, shingling of the bone in, in the more atrophic non-union, we're trying to truly stimulate uh, uh, more biology. So from my point of view, I always do the recortication. So if I'm going down to any data seal non-union, in fact, any non-union, assuming it's not a defect, then I'm going to create, as soon as I get to the bone, I'm going to stop and do a, a sub-periosteal shingling, pure decortication to increase the, the area of bone healing. Um, I do not put bone graft under it. You don't need to. Once you've elevated it, it forms bone in exactly the same way without it. And then I apply the plate provide compression and stability as described every time. Dr. Smith, I, you know, based, based on that answer and, and the, the unified bone healing theory, I, I wonder if, if that's even necessary. If we just optimize the environment, do we even need bone graft? Do we even need to do any type of decortication or, or, or would that be enough? Are we all just afraid to do that? because we're there anyway, right? What do we all think about that? So I'd say that the, um, the primary job is to neutralize strain and create a healing environment where the bone will form. And everything else is additive to that. If you look at nearly every paper where adjuncts have been used, BMPs, grafts, they're always done on the background of correcting deformity and neutralizing strain. That's the key that makes it heal the rest of, I think, are purely adjuncts, and I don't think they're necessary. Um, the ultimate test currently used is the percutaneous screw technique, where you find an actually stable fracture with a nail in already, and you simply neutralize the strain over the new side of putting in screws percutaneously. That's the Bob screw technique Bob Honey described, and that leads to healing in the vast majority of cases without any major intervention, without the plate, without bone graft, without biological stimulation, this the strain reduction alone seems to work. Right, and, and, and Malcolm, I think, I think that indicates that the osteoperiosteal elevation isn't always necessary, that at some point you just need increased stability. And whether you do that with a exchange nail or with percutaneous handley screws or with a subperiosteal uh, placed uh, plate, um, sort of extra periosteal with percutaneous technique, uh, I think are just the different ways of obtaining the same goal that you're, I think you're hundred percent right on your bone healing theory. Uh, and it's a, it's a great uh, concept to think uh, and how we get there probably varies greatly. It clearly varies with personality and technique. I entirely agree with you. One of the questions from the chat earlier was about the, uh, the use of, uh, iliac crest aspirate uh, versus using autograft. And, and, you know, one of the questions that I came up with uh, while Dr. Obremski was speaking was, you know, about autograft versus nothing versus something along those lines. And a lot of, a lot of folks feel pretty strongly about adding the autograft, even when we've improved the mechanical environment. And Dr. Obremski, you've been known to, 
do some clinical research and trials in, in your past, do you think that people would be willing to randomize to such a thing or do we all feel pretty strongly that we should do that? Um, I think that would be a hard uh, thing to get uh, past an IRB that we, you know, you can probably always get people to randomize it and it may not be that hard to sell and that, you know, we did a prospective randomized trial of allograft and BMP2 versus autograft in, in segmental defects of tibias uh, with the metric group. Uh, it's just, it's a rare bird and, you know, it took us uh, five years. We had about 50 patients or in that. And, and I had been previously an author on two studies uh, looking at BMP and allograft uh, versus autograft in retrospective reviews, which showed they were equal, but in our prospective randomized trial, that the autograft was better than the allograft and BMP2 in, in a segmental defect of the tibia, which is sort of a, a controlled hype, uh, um, atrophic nonunion in a way. Um, so it's, it's feasible, but it's challenging in, in rare conditions. Um, I think a question for Dr. Conway that, uh, that came in was uh, about the, the opportunity or the potential opportunity for uh, this nail technique to be used for uh, potentially very contaminated tibias or those that you, are, you think are at very high risk as a primary modality. There are very high risk of infection and maybe using these as a primary modality to get stability, help control the local environment, uh, at least temporarily or, or to reduce the risks of infection. Any, any, have you thought, uh, have you used it for that or any thoughts about that? Yeah, sure. Um, like say like an acute, um, like 3B tibia. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that, uh, I personally think it works really well, you know, for that. Um, you know, I just remember one case, it was pretty contaminated. We put an X-Fix on, debrided it once or twice, came back, put an antibiotic coat of rod in, did a little gas rock flap. And that was the last surgery we did on that guy. And he actually healed. They didn't have the bone grafted or anything. And he didn't get infected. And so I do think that there's a role for that in uh, high-risk patients, you know, like for arthrodesis, infected, charco, ankles, you know, diabetics and things like that. I use that a lot in that indication. Um, and so, and there's been papers, uh, you know, in some of those, uh, uh, antibiotic coated uh, commercially available rods uh, are being used in uh, multi center trials for, uh, you know, Europe, of course, but um, uh, for some of these indications for open fractures, you know, fresh fractures, and uh, they're having a nice result. So I, I really think uh, absolutely that it, there's a role for that. Uh, and if you uh, you know, don't have an infection, you're much more likely to get a union. And I really feel like that's important. You know, it's like you said, control the local environment and things are much better. So Janet, uh, Bill here, just a question. So I've had it happen that you put an antibiotic nail in that patient, they come back at, you know, two months with a, you know, gram negative infection. And then you pull the nail and you've got a nail, but the, but the antibiotics, uh, but the cement is delaminated. What do yeah. you do as someone who uh, I'm sure has done this for a long time and, and you, it occasionally works great, but what do you do in sort of that worst case scenario? How do you try to clean the canal with all that uh, debris in the canal? Sure. Well, uh, we actually uh, have a series we published in JOT on 42 antibiotic coated rod removals. Uh, I don't know, it might have been like September or October we did this. And so the first order of business when that happens and you have to go back and exchange the rod and of course it delaminates is we always use the uh, Moreland cement removal uh, tools, the little J hooks. And if you just, you know, it's cannulated. So if the rod comes out and you have that uh, sort of cement thin layer in there, you can go in and just hook it out a lot of times. And that it comes out as a sleeve and you don't have to do anything else. Now, if the worst case scenario happens, you can't get it out, it's stuck, you're having a lot of trouble and say it's a tibial or a femoral rod, I'll put a little egress hole distally and then either use the rear reamer or sequential reaming and ream the whole thing out and just flush the canal with, uh, you know, uh, six liters of saline, like canal tipped irrigator and whatnot. And that usually does the trick. Um, you know, it's not my ideal situation. And like I said, when, depending on how you make the rod and how you take it out and you put it in, it's been a lot less of a problem, um, 
for me, you know, uh, recently. In fact, like in our series we published in JOT, uh, the only rods that delaminated recently were the long knee arthrodesis rods. When we take them out to put in, like, you know, we would convert that to a total knee replacement, you know. Um, and I think that is just by virtue of the fact that there's such a long surface area on those long rods and it's a big curve and I've got to pull it through some spacers at the level of the knee. And uh, I had the majority of those, uh, I think there was 42 cases and I think five of them delaminated and they were all knee arthrodesis rods. So I feel like I have it down to a science now we're putting them in and getting them out. Uh, we avoid that problem, but when it happens, that's how I take care of it. Mm -hmm. Jay hooks it. Good yeah. technical tip. So also just out of curiosity that when the genomycin coated nails, which are available in Europe, become available in the States, will you would you quit using cement coated nails or do you think that the gent nails would potentially serve the same purpose? Well, you know, it's sort of interesting. I think it depends on uh, what I'm using it for. I think if I'm using it for a fresh fracture and I don't have like a, you know, say it's grade two, uh, 2B or so, or excuse me, grade two, I think where you you clean it up really well, you can put the antibiotic coated rod in, and I'm not stressed that I have like an infected non-union. I think I would use it for that. But say I really want to control the dead space and the rod diameter, and you know, um, I may be inclined to use my antibiotic coated rod because uh, there's been some studies on the antibiotic elution, and the cement actually, you know, it does sort of elude a lot in the first 24 hours, but over the course of the next four weeks, you can still get um, minimum inhibitory concentration for staph. There's been some publications on that. And so I think when you're talking about treatment for an infection, I feel, feel like my the antibiotic coated rod works a little bit better, but I have yet to really go a head to head trial on infected non-unions. And I think that would be, I'd have to take kind of like a leap there and use the off the shelf gent versus you know, what I make with a gram of Tobra and 3.6 grams, a gram of Vanco and 3.6 grams of Tobra per bag. I mean, that's a lot more than, you know, that uh, gram of uh, gent on the outside of that rod. So I don't know, time will tell. And I think this is a lot of these things are evolving because, uh, you know, uh, it's hot, infection's hot and we all have them and uh, they're big problems. And I want the solution that's going to, um, uh, make it the easiest so I don't have to keep operating on the same person, <laughs> you know? So like you said, keep thinking about ways to solve problems. And I think, uh, you know, we'll come up with some good solutions. So we'll see how we do. That's great. Um, I think for uh, Dr. Oliver, one question that I had uh, off your paper was maybe you could uh, just touch on the sort of a long-term disability uh, findings associated with some of these patients who went on to heal after their non-union treatment and what, what you saw in, in your series. Yeah, thanks, um, Jason. I, I uh, As I said, we sort of, we briefly touched on it. I realized this uh, journal covers principally about non-union in general rather than the humerus in particular, but um, we certainly were uh, slightly surprised at the level of upper limb function um, and health related quality of life and sort of pain and dissatisfaction that even these guys who had good clinical and radiographic evidence of union were reporting to us uh, at, you know, five, an average of five years down the line. Um, and that's really what kind of, with all these things, you know, you end up going off on tangents a little bit and that kind of sent us down there, well, maybe we should look and see if there's something special about these patients that develop the non-unions that's what makes them, um, you know, have an inferior outcome in the longer term. And as I said, that we, we, we've actually just published our results where we essentially compared a lot of, of that cohort that I've just told you about with uh, our humeral shaft fractures more generally um, and did some modeling on them to see if there were any patient injury management related things that, that kind of, you know, we could explain that phenomenon by. And actually the non-union was the only, um, you know, sort of non lifestyle -y thing. There are a couple of odd, odd things like you know, uh, sports participation and, and stuff that we know makes you just happier and better and less pain and better function. Uh, but developing a non-union in itself um, seems to 
um, cause these patients a lot of misery. And I don't know if it's the fact that they spend six months plus in a brace or they never truly have confidence in their arm again, or they feel that, you know, they've had to have an operation to get it fixed and they have to take care of it in a different way. I, I don't, I don't know. That's sort of beyond the, the remit really of what we've been able to look at, but it's certainly an interesting thing. And, and as I, as I touched on at the very end of uh, my interview with, with Jeff was, um, you know, I think trying to identify these guys, particularly with upper limb fractures, you know, who are going to cause problems or run into problems in, in the future is, is key, trying to get to them early and, and sort of head it off at the pass, you know, and, and prevent them from developing an established non-union is probably the, the future. It's easy, easy to say and, and difficult to do, I think. Susan, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Yeah, absolutely. So... I always think that humorous is really likely to go in a union because the shoulder goes stiff and all the motion gets focused on the fracture. So how much of that was due to shoulder stiffness? Sorry, Dr. Smith, you mean in our particular group or? Yeah, how much do you think the disability is associated with the shoulder? Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think your point is, a very valid one about the fact that shoulder stiffness is is a key driver of the mechanical elements of the non union and actually in another kind of spin-off we published that uh, risk factors for non-union in a large group of, of non-op patients and found that uh, patients with radiographic glenohumeral arthritis so lots of glenohumeral joint space and sclerosis and things were independently more likely to do, run on to uh, an non-union. That's, as you say, a mechanical thing. In that particular group, I, I couldn't tell you actually the, the proportion who had shoulder stiffness, but given the excellent you know, recovery that is related to, to the plating or the excellent union rates that are achieved with plating, you, you'd imagine that at least, at least some of them would have had uh, shoulder stiffness that might have been contributing it's difficult I, I don't know the problem is I think that's a broader problem with upper limb proms I, I would say and I, I know that's not a conversation for tonight but I think we use the quick dash particularly in our, our you know sort of retrospective follow-up type studies and there's been a lot of questions about whether that is a sensitive enough tool to you know really drill down into what what is causing these guys morbidity and and um you know, giving them that inferior outcome. So it may be related to that, that uh, aspect of how we're doing it, but that's a good question. William, I had a question for you. Just in that uh, I agree wholeheartedly with your approach that these rarely need a, uh, a bone graft, um, but I've migrated from less bone grafting to more stability. And often adding a secondary 2.7 or a plate in addition to a orthogonal to the standard four five uh, plate on the anterolateral approach for these humerus. How did you look at that? And did you, did your series have, uh, do you do dual plating or are you doing this all with standard classical uh, plating? Yeah. So uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Remsky. Uh, we, uh, we, all of our patients were managed with a single plate. Um, and the majority, as you say, were the standard 4.5, but there were, some of them were uh, three fives, um, which I think adds weight to the, you know, the fact that it doesn't really matter how you achieve the stability, it just has to be adequate. So if you're a smaller person and, you know, you, you can get good fi fixation after you've compressed the fracture fragments, then it doesn't matter how big the plate is. Um, yeah, so no dual plating. Um, it is done from time to time in our center, but just wasn't wasn't captured in the ten year period that we we saw it. So, you know, I, I think you're quite right. You know, however you achieve the stability and and the the autograph probably did uh, help in in those patients who received it to some degree. But interestingly, the non union rate was, or the recalcitrant non union rate was much higher in the ones that received bone grafts, although there was only 11, you know, eight of them, uh, only eight of them united. So that was you know, sort of 78% success rate in that group. Be so that, all that, yeah, exactly, totally. There's something else about them that the surgeons at the time obviously identified that they were at increased risk and, and felt that they needed the bone graft in the first place. I totally agree. It's not, it's not the bone graft's fault um, in any way, but uh, 
it, like I said, I think this is so it's so ripe. It, the trouble is, it, it's such a difficult area to research because, as you've all alluded to, you know, everybody brings their own experience and their own um, you know expertise and and their own preferences to non-union surgery, and and very few, you know, if any, two non-union surgeries are the same, and so you kind of have to treat what's in front of you, and it's hard to standardize that, and that makes it difficult to. I say really, really work out which bits are most important. Is it the taking down the non-union? Is it the bone grafting? Is it the type of bone grafting? Is it the thickness of the plate? Is it the number of screws? You know, I, 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 it's it's such a such a, a broad, nebulous field. I think. Perfect. Well, I, I want to be mindful of everyone's time, and I want to thank everyone for for the the questions and the and the thoughtful discussion there at the end. Um, there's two things uh, just before uh, we sign off. Number one, there will be a short survey that comes up um, and that'll help with uh, CME credit. So please uh, take the time to complete that. And I also wanted to remind everyone that the next session uh, of, of this uh, type will be the JBJS JOT injury highlight paper, uh, highlight papers, sorry, and that's uh, February 15th. So we look forward to that session as well. So. Uh, thanks for everyone uh, making the time for the sessions tonight. We appreciate it very much. Have a good night. Thanks very much. Very nice. Thanks, guys. Pleasure to meet you all. I got a lot more questions for everybody. It's just great to have <laughs> such a group of smart people to like, ask questions to. <laughs> I could go on for hours, but nobody wants yeah. to ask questions. <laughs> William is getting very late over there. It's uh, yeah, twenty past two here, so I should probably oh, get my head down. You should head Malcolm, to bed, Malcolm. I got a quick question for you, if you got a second. So, sure. it, it, with these humerus fractures, that often we get, you know, young people, great bone, AFT, and a short oblique or transverse fracture, and you put a plate on or two plates, and then at three months you've got callus. How? How does I, I just tell our fellows sometimes that the humerus didn't read the book um, and I can't explain it, but I, you sometimes see that. Can you, in your bone healing theory, um, how does, it, can you help me understand what's going on? Well, it's not my bone healing theory. It was no, not yours, I know, but it's, it's, a, it's a great theory, but I, I don't understand why that happens. So it's just a way of thinking about the healing process. I think that's important. I don't think after stability is very often achieved, frankly. Yeah, I think very probably. commonly you put a plate on and it resolves around it a little bit almost straight away. And there's also a hematoma around. So some of the callus is going to form where there's a hematoma around the bone. And, and that will just show up um, an area what looks like normal callus. It's not the same as the relative stability with a, with a, with a plate on. Um, and so I think you're going to see absolute stability next to the plate, right there the screws are. But anywhere away from that, you'll see callus formation. Um, so I, I don't think we're actually achieving absolute stability and true primary bone healing very often. Um, and I think the hematoma was, happens normally creates a lot of that callus. Okay. Wow. That's good. Those have been my suppositions. We're not as stable as we think, and that sometimes the uh, hematoma. So... Uh, that's great. Very insightful. Thank you. <laughs> I learned something. Okay, I'm going to sign off. Thanks, everyone. That was, that was a great session. Yeah, nice job, guys. Thank you.